third speaker is Jim Tobin. He started his journey with a graduate degree in business from the University of Chicago. And an interest in politics has led him to work in political and public relations. He says he has given over 1,000 interviews and worked primarily in the political side of the insurance industry. Jim became an executive in the broken and partners marketing firm there very early in the social media revolution sweeping the world. He's been president of Ignite Social Media since 2007 and has written two books on managing social media with very cool titles. Earn it, don't buy it, and CMO's Guide to Social Media in the Worst Facebook World. And Social Media is a Cocktail Party, while you already know the rules of social media. Today he works with some of the world's largest brands running social media promotions and managing ongoing social profiles and channels. about social media is you should never write a freaking book about social media. Because <laughs> they're outdated before they get to anybody, so don't ever do that. It's not a good strategy. A particularly a book called Earn It, Don't Buy It that argues for organic that comes out two months before Facebook kills organic reach. That was, a, that was kind of a, a deal breaker for the sales of that book. So uh, if any of you would buy it, that'd be fantastic because it's been a while. Um, so what I want to talk about is how social media marketing has changed over the seven plus years that we've had this agency and what we need to do going forward. Now what I'm going to do a fair amount is I'm going to bash advertising. And I'm going to bash the crappy content that most people are producing. So as to set that up, I need to tell you the two presentations you just heard are not normal. They're actually doing good stuff. Most of the stuff being done is too often crap. There aren't enough birth for these brands that let an agency actually think holistically across channels. And there's not enough good content like that video that we saw the guy recovering from his injury. So that's not normal. They're unusually good, which is why they're here. So I'm not bashing. So Facebook has changed the game for all of us. This is an article from 2008 where we were all, this is a common article, we have to build our friendship. Brands have to act human. Brands can get organic reach just by being like people. That was the mantra, right? And then this is another article I wrote December 10th, 2013, Facebook kills organic reach, 44% decline in reach in a nine day period from December 1st to December 9th. They literally shut off the battle and changed the game. This could happen next with Twitter. If you haven't seen Twitter's announced they're gonna change their newsfeed, it's not gonna be all real time anymore. It's gonna be algorithmic. Algorithmic is a, is a term, it's from the Latin, screw the brain. and then they're going to be able to turn on and off what we're able to show people. And Instagram, we track a lot of data for a lot of clients, and Instagram engagement is shooting through the roof. It hasn't really reached Facebook yet, so Facebook's trend line is down. Instagram's up. Facebook still has reach, even with the organic thing, but Instagram's threatening to pass it. Facebook owns Instagram. They can do this whenever they want. So Instagram, there's no reason it can't happen. So that's the scenario we find ourselves in as a social media marketing agency in 2014. But when I look back more, I look back at a lot of the mistakes we made since 2007. And by we, I mean the platforms, the mistakes Facebook's made, and we as marketers have made. Because marketers are famous for finding a golden goose and then just killing the thing. And so we've done a lot of these poisoning of these platforms um, as well. Instagram tried to be very careful with their ads. They're not too careful. So marketers kind of have a lot to blame. So let's talk about what's happened since 2007. I wrote Social Media as a Cocktail Party in 2007, published in 2008, and at the time when we started working on this, you could not have a brand page on Facebook. So we looked at people who were like Nature Made Lisa, who were Nature Made Vitamins, was at a regular page and was friends with people who cared about health. And there was some great marketing being done because you had to figure out the kind of stuff that Pace has to figure out. Who cares about what I do? Who cares about my industry? I can't just pay to reach them. I have to figure out how I genuinely get them to care and where are they, when they care, and how can I get there. So the cocktail party analogy was, was a good one at the time. And then this happened. And her time is up. Ninety-nine point six percent of ad units displayed on Facebook are not clickable. 
they have a 99.6 failure rate from that metric, and they double their income every year. I wish I could fail so frequently and double our brand income every year. The other thing with 2008, this is an article that was on all Facebook in 2008, a very common thing that everybody, including Mark Zuckerberg, was saying, was that ads on Facebook are going to revolutionize advertising. Because we know so much about who you like and who you engage with and what music you like and what movies you like, that we're going to be able to serve better ads than ever before. How's that working? By 2013, Mark Zuckerberg, who had said cookie-based advertising is terrible, went to cookie-based advertising. Retargeting was the big innovation on Facebook. You can now retarget. The same thing you could have done five years ago on every other website. So he wasn't lying in 2008. He just figured out that it was really hard to build an algorithm that correctly map people's lives. Turns out that's hard for Zuckerberg, or Mr. Mander in his free time. <laughs> We were all told to get famous because we could reach, as you remember, in the space, it was 16% was the number. You do a post, about 16% of your fans will see it, right? So we all raced every month. I wrote, who was it the lead to build the biggest fan pages? And then marketers, we did shortcuts. We did cheesy stuff like boost likes. We never did that, but other people did where you just, I want to actually, I did this for a blog post. I bought 10,000 Twitter followers. It cost me 50 bucks. 50 bucks. Twitter's taking them all away, by the way. So we took short, we took, we took shortcuts. One of our very large clients did a million dollar buy to acquire fans. The, the very large media buying agency suggested it. Oh, you want fans? We can get fans. 20 cents a fan, a dollar a fan, a dollar fan, we want And we argued very strenuously against this. If you give us a million dollars, we will get you a huge number of much more relevant fans. Now they said we could just do this buy and money for relevant fans. And they did. And we ran the page and they cut their reach 66% the next month. And they cut their engagement 60% the next month. They killed their own page. Six months later, we were fired because the engagement rate was too low. Uh, they did it. But I'm not there. I'm going to move on. <laughs> the other thing that we've done wrong is social promotions. So remember when Facebook had a default landing tab and we all ran sweepstakes and stuff on there? Well, they took that away. And 80, 90% of marketers stopped doing social promotions and began to believe that social media marketing is Oreo W the Dark. That, my friend, is, is not social media marketing. It is this much of social media. It's even this much of content marketing, which is a percentage of, in my view, social media marketing. You may have to see the world slightly differently. But, um, so there's, there's these little things, and then there's content marketing, and then there's social media marketing, and then there's marketing, right? That is not all we can do. This program we ran for Doc got 300 million impressions for the TV show Defiance, which had only 2.7 million viewers on its premiere and went down from there. A tremendous reach. It also had a 52% opt-in for registrants to opt in to Dodge email. So for social promotions is when you can drive actual measurable business results versus likes, right? For Nature Neighbors was our first real client. We won them in 2007. Our first real client, they have a product called Sammy. It's a supplement you take every day to keep you in a normal, happy mood. It's mostly taken by women from 30 to 45. Because women from 30 to 45 spend a lot of time around men 30 to 45 who just piss them off. <laughs> so they have to take this drug to deal with us. So it's not a drug, it's a supplement. So we had to figure out a campaign for that. But we did a campaign where we gave away a blogging uh, job, gave away a job to write about your book. We got 500,000 visitors to a vitamin micro site. Fantastic, right? Completely freaking irrelevant. What was relevant is that 36,000 of those 500,000 that came off of the page where they were participating in the social promotion and went over to take the mood quiz. Is Sammy right for me? Where to buy? Because they had research that said people who went to those pages then went to Walgreens and Walmart and everywhere else and bought Sammy at a much higher rate than people who didn't come through those pages. The 36,000.
6,000 people that we got to those pages was about 6x the high point they've ever had, despite $10 million in direct response television advertising. Our entire program, including paying the winner of the blogging program, was $100,000. This stuff is better than advertising when it's done right. The challenge is, when it's done right, it's changed a lot, and you can't guarantee that it's going to be done right. So we can drive good business results when we get it right. This is a generic stock photo that I pretend is Facebook reps. But Facebook has hired a gajillion of these people, and a lot of them look kind of like this, and they come in and they sell Facebook ads. But they don't say, let's talk about Facebook ads. They say, let's talk about your Facebook strategy. And these huge brands, I mean, we can work with literally the biggest brands in the world, will call us and say, we just had a strategy meeting with Facebook. And we go, no, we didn't. It just got pitched. Um, and it's amazing to me that these people have gotten it wrong over and over and over again. It's all about fans, you know what the fan is. It's all about engagement. The best content can win. And this is great content. Oh, you can't reach your fans anymore. Uh, pay to boost every post. Which is also mathematically untrue. You will pay more if you boost every post. And if you only boost good posts, you'll pay more and get less. If you follow what Facebook reps are currently telling. So listening to, and it's not just Facebook, Twitter reps, Tumblr reps, they have a job. They have to sell their stuff. It doesn't mean we have to understand, we don't have to listen to them and follow their strategy. We have to factor into our strategy. Why did this happen? Well, Facebook went public. If us as users were ever their constituency, we are certainly no longer. And they've done a fabulous job of that. This week, the stock was at 78, it started at 38. They bought Instagram as a hedge. And if you've seen the, the data on team use of Instagram and Facebook, Facebook's way down. Instagram is way up. Beautiful business move. They bought WhatsApp as a hedge. Beautiful business move. So as a company, they don't know what they need to do, but as social media marketers, they're not necessarily helping us. It also turns out to be wildly hard. Does anyone know what this image on the left was? There's Greek symbols. Or we're supposed to rush it, one or the other. Um, so this was the formula for edge rank. This is the algorithm that Facebook used for several years to determine what you saw in your news feed. How friendly were you with the person? What kind of content do you like to see? How old is the content? That no longer exists. The new algorithm reportedly has 100,000 factors it considers to decide what content to show. So it turned out to be really, really hard to map what my life of a particular movie meant for my propensity to buy a certain brand of diapers when I get children. Turned out that was hard. So they walked away from it, they bought a company called Atlas, which is an ad retargeting platform, and now they'll be able to use your Facebook profile to stalk you all over the web. Fantastic idea for ad retargeting. They'll make a lot of money doing this. Not what they promised to do originally. And creating content, you see, you have 65 people creating content for Verizon alone. You know why? It's hard. These are three of our clients, Hit Jewelers, Staples, Corningware. It is hard to create content every day that is brand relevant and going to resonate on platform. It's a lot of work, but a lot of brands that aren't as big as Verizon and Walmart heard it was free to post on Facebook. So they hired interns to get to work. Right? Turns out it's hard to drive results from this. And it's also hard to measure. Did anyone learn this funnel? Do they still teach this funnel anymore? Yeah, it's fake, so don't believe it. If it was ever real, it is certainly no longer real. The funnel now looks kind of like a fish, where you might sometimes find a video and then research a product, find a product, and then re watch a video, see a post, and then look at a blog, order an outfit, and then post pictures of it. It's the funnel no longer exists. And so it's very difficult to measure the success of what we do, which is different than it's not working. It's hard to prove if it's working or not. It's different than it's not. So the fish, fish are slippery, right? See what I did there? I we don't have to try to So, so this is a very confusing chart that talks about the different social platforms and how likely they are to be the first touch in a buying process. First touch meaning, 
went to YouTube, I saw a video, and I went to the website, it was my second touch, and then I read an article on a blog, it was my third touch, and then I bought, and that was my final touch, right? So the idea that different channels can be first touch, second touch, middle touch, last touch, only touch, really hard for most brands to measure this. I mean, software, like Google Analytics can now do this, but could a year or two ago, multi-touch attribution, it's kind of tough stuff to measure what is social an impact when we're dealing with this fish. Social may be the first impact, it may be the last impact, it may be the middle impact, it may be no impact. Really hard to measure down to pieces and pieces of content. So, so what do we do about it? So I was really negative for a while. So now I'm going to stop and be, be happy with you. So what do we do about it? The first thing we do, need to do is be realistic about what each of our brands, each of our clients can do on social. Does social have a place? Not necessarily for every brand. I was giving a talk two nights ago, and this company was a, a glass replacement. When you break your windshield, nobody wants a relationship with that company. <laughs> you want it when you need it, and you want it to be over in an hour. So you're not going to like a glass company's replacement windshield Facebook page. So knowing that on fashion and beauty, there was some conversation about that earlier, Pinterest does extraordinarily well. But for business and industry, Pinterest not so much. So we went with the five Chrysler brands, Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, and Fiat. And Pinterest came out, Pinterest reps came in and said, you got to be on Pinterest, Pinterest is a buying engine, blah, blah, blah. It turns out for new cars, not so much. Old cars, muscle cars, yeah, but new cars kind of look the same. They're not really interesting to pin. So it doesn't really work well for cars. So understanding what you as a brand, back to the cocktail party, what you as a brand have to contribute to contribute your conversation, and if you do this for a living, you should have something interesting to contribute. What's your ability as a company to produce that content? Which a lot of them have to hire companies like us and Pace and Volvo to produce that content. How frequently can we produce it? And where are the people and what mindset are they when they care about this? I'm not on Facebook to see that. I'm stuck in my high school program, I suppose. <laughs> The other thing is appreciating the difference between marketing and advertising. So many people look at MySpace, call themselves social media marketers, and all they do is buy Facebook and Twitter ads. They are social media advertisers. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's just not confuse the two. Marketing and advertising are not the same thing. Advertising has a lot of values in terms of reach and all that kind of stuff, but in terms of what people trust, Number one, recommendations from people I know. Number two, consumer opinions posted online. Number three, editorial content. This is what people actually trust. So to the extent you can get an exposure, a single exposure in the top versus at the bottom, you're going to be successful. Now what's at the bottom? Where is it? Ads on social networks support from the bottom. Hey, we beat text ads on mobile phones. Hey, kudos. Right? But good social media marketing generates recommendations for people I know, generates good content, generates consumer opinions posted online, generates that stuff that people trust when they make purchase decisions. And discovery of products has changed dramatically for lots of factors. Technology, um, in a general rise in, in wealth among the whole world, even the you know, the, the middle class and lower class like have cell phones and have an unfathomable luxury 30, 40 years ago, right? So people now give money to Kickstarter campaigns that may or may not ever get made. So by definition, that's disposable income, right? We're hoping people actually get something out of it. But now people discover content on Pinterest, on Twitter, on Facebook, and then they buy it. So the, the macro studies like this show that yes, in fact, people are discovering content on social, products on social, they're researching products on social, and they are buying products on social. That's a good start. We're not as good at saying they bought because of what we did here on social. So that's what we have to evolve better at. And to do that, we need to get away from the embassy mentality. When we worked with Bing several years ago, they had an inter internal person for YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and I can't remember the fourth one at the time. Four different people by channel. 
That is a deeply flawed strategy today. You need to figure out what you can say, this is what you showed earlier, and then where should it go? Not what's our Facebook strategy. And you may end with how are we going to use Facebook different than we use Twitter. Staples is a client, they have small business owners, and they have moms buying school supplies. Two different audiences. We may choose to target one on Facebook and one on Twitter, but you don't start there. You don't start with this embassy mentality. So we created what we call organic, and that's a trademark, and it's mildly clever. It's organic-ish, because since Facebook did what they had to do, we now have to pay the boost. Not everything, but you need a budget to do some paid stuff. So the difference is you don't create ads and then run them on Facebook. You create really good organic type of content and then boost it. So we call it organic. There's a trademark. I will steal actual content. I will steal ace. All right. I want to steal ace because that's pretty slick. The other thing is we have to stop thinking of ourselves as the content creators. Marketers make the brochures, the ads, the TV spots. We have to be content facilitators. Who else can create content? Our employees, our influencers. This is a program we did for a pocket wine when they introduced their white, reintroduced their white wine. We got people cooking, party, celebration influencers to put the wine into their uh, not normal content. We pay them to do this. This is kind of like product placement. It's native advertising, right? And what happened was they created much better content than we could have created in the office. It turned out to be fantastic content, very cost-effective content. But lots of companies do influencer marketing, and then they leave it there. They leave it on party blueprints, and they say, yeah, we have to start on party blueprints. We have to do better. Syndicate, aggregate, secondary syndication, repurpose this content. Can we get it on Pinterest? Can we reuse it on the brand page? Can we reuse it in a, in a, in a brochure or a white paper? We've got this great content. We need to liberate it and reuse it to get with our damage, we can guarantee impression levels at this point. Because we know what we're getting from, from these various channels. And we call it content everywhere. I slept a TM on that one too, a much of both of you. Because the way we find content time, how we're doing? Time? No, I'm not too good. Time. Okay. So uh, Google desktop searches have been flat, total volume have been flat for about three years after just climbing constantly. Why? In part because we switched to mobile. Uh, but also in part because how we discover content is very different. Robin Williams dies. Five years ago, you would have had a Google when you heard about it. You don't need to anymore. It's flying through your Twitter feed, links to articles. So you don't have to do the same searches. This ugly chart on the right is a leaked paper from the New York Times. It shows their homepage traffic from 2011 to 2013. It was cut in half in two years while the total web traffic stayed flat. You don't need to go to the New York Times to figure out what the New York Times is saying. You go to your social channels, and if the New York Times has an interesting article, as they frequently do, you go right to that article. So we now need content everywhere. And us as marketers, that's what we're spending our time figuring out, well beyond running a Facebook page, how do you get content everywhere? These are two programs we did. One's the U.S. Cranberry Association, believe it or not. The other one's ReadyWhip. And they get really good content spread everywhere. So if you go to Google, if you search for that hashtag, hashtag party ready, R-E-D-I, -E you will find content everywhere. Now, no one will go to Google and search for party ready. That's not the point. The point is it's an effective way to see how widely we proliferated that content. It is literally everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, this is an aggregator, you can see tweets, and, uh, Instagram, and Facebook, and there's a Pinterest board with, I think, 4,600 followers on it. So you can get content everywhere now, which is what you need to do when people discover things everywhere. So it's up to us as marketers to decide what we want to do for a living and what path we're going to take marketing. We can do this. These are the actual ads on my Facebook page this week. Anyone really get jazzed about writing that shit for a living? Yeah. No, me either. Um, I don't have any cats. I have two dogs. I already use Banfield, and I already bought them. So the retargeting is ineffective in this instance. It is more effective than some other things, but it happens to be ineffective. This is not exciting to me. 
We know that there's banner blindness, particularly young people, but I think most human beings don't look at banner ads anymore. We know there's banner blindness, and we know that native ads are absorbed more frequently than display ads, and we know they're more shared than display ads. We also know from this research that people trust branded content only two percentage points less than they trust true editorial form in the newspaper or magazine. And in fact, people are more likely to distrust editorial from the newspaper or magazine than from the land. Because people can see it. Okay? So, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to get better at our models. Chart B is a, like a Google Analytics kind of thing, but they have been certified now by these advertising bodies to measure attention how much time were you actually paying attention to, a, to an ad or to a piece of content? And the average for a banner ad is a little less than two seconds. So if we can put a piece of content out that people engage with for 20 seconds, now we're not selling on a CPM basis cost per thousand impressions. Because the value of being the content is exponentially higher than surrounding the content. We're just not really good at proving that yet, but progress like chart beam will get us there. We also do some of this for our clients. This is the McKinsey Purchase Loop. So McKinsey is really smart people, their version of the funnel. And we'll show, this is for an actual client that we did. Oh, awareness, consideration, yeah, we drove this many million in organic impressions, this many million clicks. We can put value on impressions because people pay for them. We can put value on clicks because people pay for them. And at the top, when people are shopping, we send people to the site. And you can quantify what a site visit's worth. So you can quantify what the site visits we sent to worth. And at moment of purchase, we can track through Google Analytics and other things how many direct sales came from social and how many sales were helped by social. And then at the bottom, post-purchase, we can collect emails. And a lot of companies can put value on a single email on acquisition. You have to buy it out by how many social gets you. And if you add all that up, that begins to tell you the value of your social media marketing. Not as sophisticated as it will be in five years, but we're getting there to begin to show the social ads value. One of my larger clients has a very sophisticated media mix modeling, it's called, which is done by Cranium Heads in the math, right? And they're able to tell you how much the TV contributed to sales, how much did freestanding inserts, how much did out of home, how much did social, how much did all of this contribute to our sales, and they're finding over and over social returning about six to one. So every time that we're measuring it, Virtually every time that we measure it, it shows positive return, at least relative to other marketing opportunities. This is a measurement is just not as sophisticated as it would be. So, I've seen a lot of blog posts recently that social media is not working. I don't know why I say that. It's simply that the path is winding. This was in the Wall Street Journal a week ago. Social media that fails to live up to early hype. The industry is changing. What we did for Ram Trucks was a photo hunt thing two years ago we would never do today. But it worked then. Just because we have to do something different now doesn't mean the social media market is It means that it's going to be harder. And it's about a, it's an under 10 year old industry. Advertising is the second oldest profession. It's the first oldest profession I've ever done. Alright, so. For me, I'm tremendously excited, seven years into this, about where this space is going, because the lines are all blurry. Publishers are becoming advertisers, brands are becoming publishers, it's all a big, crazy mess. 